I am obsessed by the real, and uh, theater is the baddest place to use realism. Because everything is uh, somehow obviously illusion. If somebody dies on stage, if somebody is hurt on stage, you know that he will do the same the day after. So how do you make people believe? How do you transform illusion in reality for moments? Yes, a very warm welcome to everybody here in the Bali. My name is Yuri Albrecht. I will try to um, lead this conversation tonight. Very, very warm welcome to El Gamzu and Milo Rao. Um, thanks for being here both. Um, this is the second time we're doing this, um, <laughs> we're doing this um, lecture series. It's a series of three, we thought. Um, Hugo van Berkel, Artist Talks, and we did one I think more than one and a half year ago, yeah. Joel Gamsu and Ivo van Hoven and me, um, because we thought in that time that it might be a good idea to talk about what it is to uh, perform and have performance art and um, um, what it is what you do on stage and talk about that because it's, it's a difficult topic and it's nice to explore it and we thought we'd, we'd do a series of that. And it was in a time where we couldn't perform. Yeah. And then, exactly, then there was, but then there was one and a half year of, uh, at least, uh, there was two years of sort of closures, so that made it even more important to talk about it. And um, so this is the second of lectures here, there was a gap of one and a half year, and there will be uh, a third one in the autumn with Marina Abramovic and Joel Gamzu. Um, but now we're having a, a conversation on performing, um, performing arts um, uh, uh, with Milo Rao, um, and it's, um, I don't think I have to introduce you very long. I think you know, the two of you are two of the most important podium uh, performance artists we have in Europe. It's wonderful that we have a real conversation on, uh, uh, on what, what it is to be on stage. Um, Mila Rao is uh, director of NT Gent at the moment. And um, I think from 2018 onwards, if I'm True. not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, but you performed all over Europe, um, uh, also doing a, a Wilhelm Tell at this moment, starting right now in Zurich. Exactly now, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, by Schiller, of course, the national. By Schiller, of course. The national play of um, mm -hmm. of, of uh, Switzerland. We ha we also have sort of a national play by Schiller, but we ne never perform it. We, we, Did Schiller Carlos? write a play for Don every Carlos. country? Don Carlos. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. But uh, it's the national play of Holland. Also, which, which one is that? Don Carlos, Don Carlos. Yeah, I mean the small small countries have uh, national plays written by Germany. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least the small countries around Germany. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. You could make a really inappropriate joke now, but I'll leave that for later. <laughs> well, please, <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets to German writing history for other people, I think I'm the wrong person to talk to. Let's go. Please <laughs> yes. go, on. go on. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, but you also make films. Um, you've been a journalist. Um, uh, you've won many prizes. You've studied uh, with Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu. Um, uh, you uh, studied uh, German and Francophonic. Fran uh, um, how do you say that? Roman, Roman, Roman languages. Ro Roman language. Roman, in, Roman languages. And um, and literature. Um, you, you do also films, movies. Um, I don't think I need to introduce you all, Gamzu, much longer. But um, uh, grew up in New York and Tel Aviv and has been uh, uh, the founder of the International Mahler Orchestra, becoming artistic director and principal, principal conductor, and you have been currently the general music director of the theater in Bremen, and that's over in about three weeks' time, isn't it? Yeah. After five years. Yeah, after five years. Um, I, uh, we, have some, we have some fragments we're going to discuss maybe later on about the um, work of um, Milo Rao, but... Um, the funny thing is, and that's one of the reasons, of course, we asked you, um, you just published this, Why Theatre? Yeah, a year ago, a year ago. Yeah. A year well, ago. I mean, when, 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 when COVID started, I asked uh, or me and the two uh, dramaturgs of, of my, or two of the dramaturgs of Antigen, we asked it, I think, around 107 makers from all around the world. I think also Ivo, by the way. Ivo is in there yeah, as well, yeah, in. sure. Um, to, to not Marina, by the way. Not now Marina. I see, no. I, see the, no. I see the mistake I did. Yeah. And um, not but of all kind, like like people known, people less known, people that are not published, people that are published a lot, to answer to this very simple question: What is theatre for you? 
Yeah, right. And um, uh, uh, why theater? That, that's sort of the same question as what, it, what we asked each other. You know, what, is, what is it to perform on stage and what you're trying to do on stage? Um, so, um, uh, Milo, why theater? Um, I, I have a text in, I know, I in it uh, yeah. I, could, yeah. <laughs> I could read out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, why? I mean, there, there's the real reason, and then I can do, give you a poetic reason if you want. Mm -hmm, please. So I failed as a movie director I, when I was quite young, and then theater was a good escape. So that was that is the real reason. Because it's cheaper, or it was cheaper, faster, um, and if you have a failure, you can do again another play, or can do parallel plays. While, I mean, a real film, if you are not uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, who does like ten films in a year. Then you have to finance it, and then you have to wait that it is edited, and it takes takes more time and gives more importance, economic importance to every every film. But perhaps you don't have to go too long. And why theater? I mean, um, but that's your personal reason. It was cheaper than film, and you failed at film, so you went to theater. Yeah, and then I came back to film yeah, later. Absolutely. But I, I, I mean, what, what I like in, in uh, what I like in, I mean, I like many things in theater. One thing, of course, is that you can mix everything together: professionals, non-professionals. Film, uh, live music, uh, you, can, you can bring everything together on a stage. Mm -hmm. So this is very beautiful. The, the second thing that I like, that this kind of, 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 of collective work, there's another text by Rune Polish, a German director, uh, that is a good friend of mine. And when I, uh, he's also in a book, and I asked him why, why theater, and he said, because I can't think alone. I need somebody to think with. To, to think with. Yeah. And that's exactly. If you would say, Milo, go in the room and uh, compose an opera, I would try to search somebody with whom I can talk and, uh, and work together to, to find. And theater is a collective way of, of creating. And I think that's, for me, the, perhaps the main reason to be together with somebody who... who, who uh, there's a, uh, an anecdote by Aki Karismeki, the Finnish uh, director, director mm -hmm. uh, who said, actually, he would have loved to become a writer but he can't concentrate alone. And when he goes to the studio and they have like 30 people watching to him, then there the situation and the tension is there, and then you have to create. Yeah, so, and I think so, this so, is, uh, is, is super important in that, in that, in that genre. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that you do it with other people, and it makes you concentrate. Yeah, and you do it every day for a public, and the public is really there, and the actors are really there, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a direct contact I really, mm -hmm. uh, I really like. You can't exclude somebody from, from a play. Oh, you can. <laughs> sometimes. You yeah. can, sometimes. Yeah. Um, so this is, this, is very, this is very different from other art forms. And I, uh, yeah, I liked it. When, you're, when you are reading, you are reading alone. When you are going to the cinema, you are watching everybody. Normally, you watch the film alone. It's a dream that you have alone. Uh, and the second thing I like in theater, I could go on for long, I just stopped and after this, is that I am obsessed by the real, and uh, theater is the baddest place to use realism. The because baddest? it's really the baddest place, mm -hmm. I think, because Worst everything place, is sort of. That, yeah, and uh, because everything is uh, somehow obviously illusion. If somebody dies on stage, if somebody is hurt on stage, you know that he will do the same the day after. So how do you make people believe? How do you transform illusion in reality for moments? This is but for is me... That, uh, is that the point, to make them believe? I mean, it's like children being confronted with Santa Claus. At the same moment, I mean, it's a Brechtian approach. At the same moment, of course, these children know it's not Santa Claus, but it is. And I think this kind of, 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 of uh, parallelity of illusion and Reality, perhaps, yeah, it's a good question because it's kind of this, this at the same time, mm -hmm. um, knowing that it is not the fact and being immersed in, 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 uh, in the performance. Yeah, because um, that are your personal reasons, but, um, and you say here, you say, um, uh, um, why theater? Because the stage makes people appear, because it, how could that be forgotten? Is our real place? Yeah. Um, and you're interested or obsessed, maybe even with reality, and that it that it can be certain you know, things at the same time. I think um, I don't know why I'm thinking about it, and I don't know who said this. Perhaps Albert Camus <laughs> uh, or somebody else that every human being is the first and the last one. 
It's also Bourdieu, by the way, who said mm -hmm. this and how he, where I started, that saying, okay, when you look close enough on, on one of us here in this room, you will have whole humanity, whole human history, everything that you can say about our species, you can have in one person. Mm -hmm. We are everybody, every of us. And this is what the stage is doing. And that's what I, 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 I love when people appear on stage that at that moment they are the first and the last. I mean, is it too kitschy for you? No, I, it's not. I'm, just, I'm, uh, I'm listening to you. So I, and, um, I can, I can go no. more technical, but no, I, I... No, no. <laughs> um, and it, and, and, um, but you're saying it's the real place. Where we, and it's the baddest place to be real. Because it's not. It's not real. Because it's surreal or it's... it's yeah, yeah, and that's why they say it's a political place in the meaning that it is a public place that you are more and less that you are. Mm -hmm. For example, when you go on stage, a lot of times I work together with non-professionals. For example, now in, in William Tell, uh, I have a, an army officer, I have a hunter, I have actors, uh, but I have also people that have no idea from the stage. Mm -hmm. But when they go on the stage, they, they are, I don't know, an allegorical figure and they are absolutely real and there and, and this is the and yeah. themselves but they play a role. and themselves they are william tell and they are just a hunter from i don't know this provincial little village and mm -hmm. is that something that they are producing consciously or is it something that they become um that's something they have to produce i think and they have to take and they have to be aware of and they have to rehearse i mean you can't um as, as, you, as, you, as you know, the authentic is not existing in a way that you just put... I mean, with children and animals, we know that. It just functions. But when you are kind of out of the state of the grace, when you are like older than 16 or 17, some people never lose it. But most of us lose it and have to relearn it for, mm -hmm. for somehow, or refine it to be on stage. Mm -hmm. And that's what interests you. <coughs> if we take it one step more, abstract and ask why theatre, why does society need live performance? Why theatre? Not for you personally, what interests you, but is, is there something which is important about theatre? If you take the question more like why should society have a theatre? I, I, would, I would expand the question perhaps to the institution or perhaps to art in general, but we can also talk about, about, about theatre, but as an institution, because I um, I think that we need that place where, in my humble opinion, I mean, how you described Bremen, there is a lot of alienation, but actually we have this practice which is non, I mean, in a Marxist way, a non-alienated practice. Mm -hmm. A practice, a pure practice mm -hmm. of giving meaning to kind of mostly meaningless things. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think this is why we have this place, to always remind us that this place exists where you just go to give meaning or to give presence or you can describe it as you, as you, as you want mm -hmm. or to, trans, I don't know, to, 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 to transfer emotion, whatever you do. But this is the place where this poor action is done, pure action, poor too. But it's, it's um, and I think that this is, this is why we have these places. And as meaning. much perverted they might, may be, and as much because of neoliberalism deconstructed they may be, these moments happen even in the worst theater. I think in my text I'm describing one moment I have at Volksbühne with an actor that was not playing for 15 years. He just had a fixed contract, he was there, uh, but never, nobody never gave him a, a chance to play because everybody hated him. And, uh, but at one moment, a, a friend of mine, um, he had the chance to make a play there, it's 20 years ago, and he, he gave this guy the chance to play. And I remember that in the end, it was uh, from, from Céline, it was Professor Ypsilon, I don't know, it's a, it's a monologue that is quite unknown. Um, and in the end he says, I die. And then he went, he opened a kind of a door in the floor, he disappeared, he closed the door, and he disappeared forever because the day after was his retirement. And um, for me, I was watching this. He said he was never in stage and then retired. Great. It was so great. And I was saying, this is kind of that theater, you know? Yeah. So I, uh, it's, yeah, it's real and it's performance. But is it theater for but you or was it theater for him too? Um, I, I never talked to him. He di disappeared. I don't know. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I guess that it was also revenge uh, somehow, and it was also a symbol, and that it was just uh, But that's a lot also of an artistic energy. 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I did this play that we showed in Ita with Edouard Louis, the French writer, mm -hmm. and in the play he's asking, but why would we go on stage? Why would, you tell, would we tell our story? And he, say, he says, it's about revenge. It's about revenge. It's about getting that place that perhaps you never had and that you can have in art. And when I'm thinking about this, this uh, Céline himself and this actor who is playing Céline and who was never uh, asked to play for 15 years, of course it was revenge. But I didn't know that. I'm only now reflecting on it. But at that moment, for me, it was the perfect representation of death. But you, uh, you, well, if, if, you, if you listen to... I mean, this is theatre. Huh? You're on stage as well. Um, you're performing as well. It's not theatre, but is it um, um, there? The orchestra and the, the the artists who are playing or the, you conducting. I mean, you're not acting. You're there. Re it's more real, real than the real place Milo describes. Or is I don't not? think there's any real difference. I think art is art, and when you have a person on a stage, it's not real in the sense that they are a function, they are a role, whether they are playing themselves or the, the, playing the, a violin player. They're, they are someone on a stage, and therefore there is a perspective between the audience and the person on a stage that will always be different to if we meet for coffee. So it doesn't matter if, it's a, if it's, you call this role uh, Romeo or you call this role a violin player, it's still a different perspective. I think what makes things real is, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure I can put it as sophisticatedly as you did, but in my, in my simple words, I think it's, it's really much more about the perception of the person watching than about what the person doing it is thinking. And I mean, I don't know. The Could you have a theater without public then? Could you play just alone, like in a, in a Beckett world on a stage? You could. The question is, what, what, and to what, what's the purpose? And I think that, you know, I was thinking about when you were asking him the whole time what, what I would say to that, because I think it's a difficult question why you do it. And of course, you always have both, you have the personal answer and you have the, let's say, the, the, the collective answer. And the mm -hmm. first, the person, my personal answer would be very honest, but quite just because I cannot live without it, really. I mean, it's not, it's not very high and it's not very selfless. It's just because I need that to survive myself. Mm -hmm. I, I need to go, I need to, I cannot express myself, but more than that, I cannot feel myself without doing it, so I need to do it. But that's nobody else's problem. Nobody, no, ta no taxpayer has to pay for me to feel myself. That's exactly. a, my first nice joy. I mean, yeah. we're not paying, so, yeah, but why should we pay? Yeah. I mean, no. yes, no, that's kind, that's very kind, yes. But I mean, it's, let's say it's only, <laughs> I only <laughs> find it partially morally legitimate if at least one other person has at least as much out of it. Yeah. And um, and I really, I have to say, as opposed to, I mean, how he described you, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm not interested in reality at all. Oh, God, uh, I leave. Huh? No, no, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I'm, at, I'm yeah. getting at no, the, in a sense the difference between... I, I don't, first of all, I have no idea what reality <coughs> is anyway. Second of all, I see it all day long and don't understand. And I think, if I think of all these people around me, and I think, you know, it reminds me of a conversation I once had with a friend of mine, she's a doctor. I think the first time she's ever been to a concert was because I really begged her for about three years. Uh, she really didn't want to go. She went and she really hated it, but that doesn't matter, you know, she tried. But I asked her and you know, every time we would meet, she would tell me about you know, this person who came to the hospital and died and this other person who came and almost died and this person and, and I was thinking, my God, I spent the whole night, last night, thinking about three bars in a Mahler symphony. I came to the conclusion that I have found no solution, but nobody died in the process. And I felt really a little bit ashamed at the end of that because I was like, okay. And then I thought about it a bit long and I thought, without being megalomanic about it, what is the point of all of these people being surviving these hospitals to then just exist? And I'm not saying that what I'm offering people is in a way a, a, a giving their life an added value because even, even us artists, I don't think, are as uh, megalomanic as that. But... If they're going out of their day-to-day -day life for a little break of an hour or two or three or hopefully not too long, what I want to offer them is definitely an escape from whatever reality they have, not reality. Mm -hmm. And but, an but, escape into being able, like I do, to feel themselves. 
Because I think the world that we live in does everything possible for people not to feel themselves. Mm -hmm. And if I am able to pe give people, and for me, the piece that I'm performing is just a tool. I mean, not to, I mean, sorry, Beethoven, but it's really, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's done sincerely, if it's done convincingly, and if it's from, done from the whole heart and on a high level, mm -hmm. it, it's just a portal for them to actually, the, 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 the happening is between the person and themselves. I'm just if possible, making, helping them, or let's say facilitating that. And if I am, then I'm okay, starting to be okay with people, with taxpayers paying for that. The happening is inside the person. No, it's between the person and themselves. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it's Whatever is happening on stage is a facilitator. Okay, so what your performance is actually inside every man and woman in the public. No, my performance is a catalyst mm -hmm. to whatever experience the person, every person in the audience can want or does not want or cannot have. And it's none of my business what they're having. But on the other hand, um, you are on stage. You said you're playing a role. But, I mean, you are who you are. You are conducting. You are yourself. You are not playing anything else than being there. Yes. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you're not, in that respect, adding another layer to, of interpretation, of possibility, or you know, being a symbol at the same time as yourself. Oh, of course I am. You know how much yeah. every single person in the audience is projecting something else on me, and all of them are wrong. Mm -hmm. What are they projecting? I don't know. You have to ask them. Mm -hmm. But every, for every person, they go on stage, and they, on an actor, a dancer, a conductor, they will mm -hmm. project something. It's part of their, part of the, if, if it's, if it's yeah. successful, mm -hmm. uh, even if not, but they will project something, and it's great. And I think that it's, uh, the more different projections there are, the better, because every person brings their own story to the whole, and therefore they will experience something else. And if I'm good at what I do, then I will be able to just create as many impulses as possible, but it's then their own... I, I don't want to contradict you. Please do what, what you say, but um, I think we are doing, in the effect, very much the same. And perhaps all artists. Huh? That's not only the two of us. We are now on this beautiful sofa, quite close. So I've <laughs> tried to connect. But uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, when you when you talk about this realness and this projection that you have on the on the on the public, and I think it's true that there is an alienation and there you are not inside yourself, you're not feeling yourself, that's a kind of the normal no state. Yeah. And then you have a concentration, you have a moment of, I don't know what you do, but you can call it art and there's other moments that can create this too. For example, I, I uh, lately, the, the, some weeks ago, uh, a, a cat from the neighbors was crashed on the street and then I have a car and they were asking me, can you bring it to the hospital? And I knew I have to be fast to bring this cat to the hospital. I was just thinking about because you were talking about this doctor. And it was full of meaning because I wanted to save the cat. It seems now a bit not so important, but I... I no, no, I had a cat for 19 years. I love cats, so I'm with you. And, and, and this is a moment, or I imagine when... I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of music, by the way, listening to it. And exactly what you describe happens thanks to people like you. So what you create, for me, I would call it realness, you know? It's something that happens and you can't describe, but you are in the moment, you are one, you are completely concentrated or not concentrated, however you want to call it, mm -hmm. but this is what happens with a piece of art, yeah, that's of why it exists. But you yeah. know, the most beautiful thing is that, I mean, you know, whenever I hear interviews or read interviews or, or colleagues that talk about how they stand on stage and they just want to give the audience this and tell the audience that, and, and I always read that and I think it's so sad that people feel that they have to to say all this bullshit because that's what the world wants to hear from them. It's not true. It, the only thing people want is them to be honest. And honestly, when a pianist is sitting on stage or a violinist is sitting on stage, they're not thinking of <coughs> Mr. Smith in row three or Mr. Muller in row five. They're in the music. And that's what Mr. Muller wants to experience. Mr. Muller doesn't want to see somebody sitting on a stage telling them a story. They would go home. They want to see someone that is actually in the music, so what they create has an added value for the listener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think I can, at the same time, it can be both. I can be 100% in myself in order to be a, you can call it a vehicle or a medium if you want to make it spiritual, but you can also just say concentrated as you did, which I prefer, uh, to create something that is an intense experience, which is between me and the music, or in my case, between me and the musicians, because we are, of course, in this, in this bubble. I don't have to, in any way, that my only duty to the audience is to do that, to be in myself. So I'm in myself and out of myself at the same time. We've looked up a few fragments of 
uh, Milos' work, and there's a fragment of five easy Just pieces. Just, I, I, I want to give one <coughs> one comment. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I yeah, also want to see these yeah? these snippets, yeah, of course, yeah, because yeah. I like my work a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I would it's your work. Just yeah. to, to, I think it's a misunderstanding. A lot of people think that uh, theatre makers, political theatre makers, or filmmakers are dogmatic leftists who want to give lessons to everybody. Oh, but I didn't think that. No, no, no. But I think a lot of people, not okay. you, I know yeah. you're okay. much too sensitive to think things like this. But a lot of people think, but I think theatre is never, and art is never about information. It's never about giving lessons. And even if there is a content, this is not the point. You know? It's not about, I think nobody, I mean, you can read Chekhov at home. Chekhov is, 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 is boring when you saw it once, but you go for this moment of the actors. You don't go for, you know what they will say, you know? I mean, when I never get bored of Chekhov. Oh, sorry? I never got bored of Chekhov. No, but that's why. But I think if I would say, okay, now, Joel, I, I read like 10 times to you over 200 years, because this is the, the bourgeois culture of adaptation, I read now 500 million times to Mr. Miller Chekhov, yeah. and it's just me reading Chekhov, they would say after the first time, or if, after the first scene, they would say, okay, Milo, stop, let's forget about mm -hmm. Chekhov. Yeah. No, because, because it's, it's about not you. about that they yeah, want to, because it's only me, yeah. and I'm only reading it. But that's so. why the whole understanding of interpretation is completely flawed. Which is why also, I mean, we were talking about that earlier, the, why the classical music world is particularly flawed as opposed to other ones. And that's why, I mean, I've, I mean, I'm, I mean I'm a little jealous of you because you, had a, you started in a sort of the, the, the point zero that you started fighting against was, let's say, 100 years ahead of the point zero I'm fighting with, which is really believing that there is such thing as a piece of music that we as servants of the art only have to mm -hmm. then execute, mm -hmm. which is such a... Such a completely stupid thing to think and based on first of all you can uh, you can uh, negate that on a purely physical level because what is a piece of music but should you be able or allowed to take beethoven apart as we take shakespeare apart the same way it's not even about first of all there's no such thing as being allowed to do anything mm -hmm. second of all be doing that anyone can do anything if someone is enjoying that and having a good time that's fine with me if you're asking should people pay millions of euros for someone to be doing that on a regular basis in a public theater? Some will say yes and some will no, and that's the beauty of art. Mm -hmm. But that's not the point about what is allowed and what's not allowed. The idea that it is even possible to execute Beethoven as it is, is a joke. It's a piece of paper with dots on it. What is Beethoven? You know, so the, the fact is, I mean, I'm struggling every week with every orchestra I work with, with every audience I deal with and so on, with people telling me, but what you're doing is not, um, it's not authentic enough, it's not true enough to the original. And I go, uh-huh, which original? Second of all, the, every great composer, and I'm willing to put my hand in fire for this, would have liked nothing more, or actually the only thing they would search for, is for their piece to be, be a vehicle for a living tradition, for a living culture of dealing with yourself and the art. So I'm sh if Beethoven would see how all his professors are sitting and arguing whether it's a dot or a dash, and they think that they're be doing justice to him, he would kill them all. <laughs> because they're doing justice to their own fear of realizing there is no manual of right and wrong. There is no such thing. So th that's why I'm saying you're completely right that Chekhov, I mean, of course, I, I love to read Chekhov at home. Sorry, uh, and sit and then, but then it's between me and myself because I read this beautiful, incredible literature. I'm a huge Chekhov fan, so it was a picture. Fair enough, example. I like uh, him too. Uh, and it, it makes me feel things, but that's my own personal business. Then I go to a theater and I see great actors or shitty actors, it doesn't matter, do something that makes me feel things or doesn't make me feel things. Again, it's my own personal thing. But every single time I go is because I want, of course, to make see these people bring something to life. That because what is I mean. The, 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 the script, the book, is the beginning. And it's the same with the score. And I think there is, there is such a misunderstanding of what is... I think that being truthful... I mean, of course, all I do in every rehearsal is try to, first of all, make sure that we play all the notes that are written in the score. That's clear. But playing all the notes that are written in the score is, has very little to do with it, achieving great performance. So this is where we start. And then, why do we do it? Why do we do it? Again, the personal reason mm -hmm. is because I have to. Mm -hmm. And the, the public reason is because I really truly believe that there are a few things, I mean, Beethoven is an example, but it could be Schubert, or it could be Mahler, or it could be something that composed yesterday, mm -hmm. 
that there are few things that can give people a more intense encounter with themselves as music. Mm -hmm. And if I'm able to achieve that, and I think I can only achieve that if, as you say, every time they come and listen, I w they would experience something that is truthful for me in that moment, for my musicians in that moment, and that is, of course, based on this great art that this composer gave us. And I'm not saying all of this because I'm sure there are a lot of people, <coughs> hopefully not here, but there are always the people that accuse me of arrogance who say, oh, you talk about these great masterpieces as if you were more important than them. It's exactly the opposite. It is out of incredible admiration to these artworks that I feel that we are doing what we are producing or what we think we are, because it's impossible, what we think we're producing when we execute or when we re, um, recreate them we create. Is, yeah. uh, is a very, very, very pale version of what the people that created them actually intended for. Some of what we just discussed, um, Milera put into a scene, and we're going to look at that scene, and we go back to some of the conversation we had just before or move on, but let's have a look. It's, a, it's out of uh, five easy pieces, and um, it's the beginning of it. Zou jij voor toneel, hè? zou jij dan iemand kussen op een podium? Kussen? Mm -hmm. Wij twee? Nu? No way. No way. En hier, Polly, zou jij iemand kussen op het podium? Als het nodig zou zijn voor het stuk, dan zou ik het doen. Oké. Okay. Een acteur speelt nooit voor zichzelf. Een acteur speelt voor het publiek. Hij denkt dus niet aan zijn eigen plezier, maar aan het plezier van de mensen die naar hem kijken. Ik denk dat ook zelf maar. Een acteur is net als een vakman die elke dag naar zijn werk gaat. En het daar ligt zijn grandeur. Winnen zegt, theater is als een poppenkast. Maar niet met poppen, maar met echte mensen. Maar als ik iemand kus, kust Polly dan? Of is het haar personage dat kust? En als ik op jullie schiet, schiet Polly dan? Of is het haar personage dat schiet? We change it. It's somewhere in the middle, but it's it's a play with um, mainly ch almost only children in it. So there's yeah, yeah. one grown up in it. Yeah, it's a wonderful play. Um, it's very very um, uh, like well like so many of your works. It's very impressive. <laughs> but here um, you put in these conversations about what it is if you are on stage. Hmm? Yeah, I, this is this is linked uh, to the. I, I had two times panicking when you were talking about bars. I remember when I did, I did a Mozart opera that was then in the end crashed in uh, Grand Théâtre de Genève uh, as director, uh, and um, and um, I, I remember when I came the the, the Aviel Khan he said Milo you should also go to the musical uh, rehearsals to watch a bit and then I remember it was on page uh, then some singer came to me and said Milo ah that's fine that you are already here so he on page two hundred bar fifty three what do I do here. What do I feel here? And I said, I have no idea. I don't even know where we are. I can't read music. I, I, I'm sorry. Huh? Then I was panicking and was going home, listening to Mozart again and again and checking it. And then I was reminding when I was starting to work with children, because they asked me, do you want to do a play with children? I thought, so why not? And then the first day when I had to work with children, I was panicking. I was like, how do, you, do I do it? How do you work with children? I don't know. Uh, and I was, I never made a, a school for directors or an art school, I, sociology, you said it in the beginning, or Roman languages, as you uh, explained. And um, um, I, I was starting reading books about directing and about improvising and about everything. And for me this, and that's why it's called uh, Five Easy Pieces, which is a piano book, um, for me, it was like a directing school, working with these children. And every piece we have is another approach of how you could, it's the story of uh, Dutroux, so the yeah, you saw it. child yeah. killer. And, um, um, but every, every piece for me, every, every week I worked with them was for me like a school, like, like, like learning to do it. 
and I was really reflecting on it mm -hmm. together with the children, and that's why this play became an acting school or a directing school. It's funny because the youth school. orchestra is exactly the same. Sorry? A youth orchestra is exactly the same. It was for me every time. It was the project I was most terrified of in the whole season because the, it was not as young because I think the kids were like, what, eight or ten or something From like eight to, yeah. yeah something like that. Uh, so the youth, youth orchestra is like 15 to 18, something like that. But they see through you like an x-ray. And if you're fake, even if you're not aware of it that you're fake, but they feel it already. So it's like someone forcing you to be truthful to yourself and sincere all the time, which is the biggest gift that one could ever give you. But my God, it's, it's a tough mirror sometimes. And, he, and, and here, um, um, the, I mean, the kissing, if, do you want to kiss, hey, could you kiss me? Could you kiss me on stage? Would it be real? Would, uh, who would be kissing? Is it, the, is it the, the, the puppet or is it you who's kissing? That becomes... Um, Difficult to say what's real and what's not real, of course. And then the shooting, if she would be really shooting at the public and there would be somebody dead, that would be easy. <laughs> because then somebody's dead in the, in the, in the, in the audience. Yeah, and, and one thing that was even more uh, impressive to me was to see the liberating and, as we say today, empowering force of, of acting and of theatre to these children. Because I... I um, uh, we teach them uh, and I explain to them when they go on stage it's like on a football field I'm the trainer and you can say percentage how good they are but it's about training and the more you train the better you go and the rest it, it's done by the public it's done by the moment it's done by the group it's done by your talent by whatever uh, but you have to train and they really trained mm -hmm. a lot and in the end when I watched them when they, they played it several hundred times and the same kids. The same kids, and then there was a second cast. But the first cast played it, I think, 150 times on all continents. They really toured uh, a lot. And, um, um, and I watched them sometimes in the technical rehearsals before playing. And then you saw how they play fast, they play themselves. Then they started playing after like one month. They started to play with the public. And for example, this, this small uh, little girl, Rachel, who said, uh, I, I don't want to kiss. She has another scene where she <laughs> cries, and there's a lot of emotions. And uh, she went every evening, she went further, and people was really crying. And some people couldn't stop anymore to cry. And I said, Rachel, there's one last lesson. You don't do this to a public. You don't go so far. This is unfair. And then she started to reflect on it. What's, it. what's unfair about it? No, because you have at one moment, or especially as a child, of course, you have them really in your hand. Mm -hmm. And then she, I, I saw, because it's a, it's a scene about, it's called a lesson in submission. Mm -hmm. It's a scene about, about sad, sadism and, and relations you can have with somebody that you have in your hand. And she did exactly the same while playing the victim. She did same, exactly the same with the public. Mm -hmm. And I was watching from it from behind it. It was somehow on a very... Unconscious level, it was uh, extremely perverse, mm -hmm. but in a in a in a pure way, it was not that that. The, and I just explained to her, this is this is too much. Besides the fact that it was a bit too kitschy too, but it was it was just I said, okay, this is we have to have a balance. We are not here to torture people. You are a beautiful young child, and you should not go so far because this is not fair. And uh, I. I and there you see the strength of, of that stage can give you as a as a as a as a as a as a, as a, as a person. And uh, and that play was for me also about about this. Of course, it's about power relation in art. It's about about many many subjects. Um, but this for me was the most interesting one to see how liberating and empowering it can be to. Um, to people to do this art because mm -hmm. it's a cliche that you always say, okay, art is liberating, blah blah blah. But I think the most art case, is liberating. It's many. I mean, in the theatre, we are a, we are a very leftist uh, club of people. No, we I've are. Noticed. It's very important to us that the people is liberated. But that's a quite a, quite a fascist sentence, which is why I'm surprised. Why? 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 I only know liberated? sentences with other things liberating. That's why I was a little. Uh, I've never heard that before. That art is liberating. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I hear it I, not exactly in this wording, but I, I mean, perhaps more in the, yeah, in the meaning that art would, 
give you a freedom that you don't have somewhere else or that art would yeah liberate you from from perhaps your i don't know your position you have in society or that you are bullied or that you whatever you know mm -hmm. uh, whatever you do i mean you have youngsters that are bullied and they go to the theater club in the in the in the in the, in the high school and then they are so doing art like, liberates you not consuming art or is it is there any difference at all ah yeah this could be fascist to say when you consume art you're liberated so yeah it's true no 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 it's doing art mm -hmm. it's doing art that's but it might be a cliche but i i i in this in this child play i i I learned it as, but liberating in a, in a, in a, creating another power relation. You know, it's not a, a pure liberation of then you are free and you see somebody free, but it's somebody that then starts to play with somebody else. I, I think that for me actually it was exactly the opposite because the moment that I, let's say, I caught that drug for the first time, drug music. Yeah, um, and before yeah, I have in front of people. constructed the most uh, no, first of all, just music at all okay. in itself. I have entered the most uh, definitely the strongest dependency that I've ever been involved with in my life, and it's definitely the furthest away from freedom, but is the most beautiful mm -hmm. dependency that I've ever been in any way involved in. So I wouldn't call it freedom or liber uh, liberty, because. I, the only thing, I, I know it sounds very kitschy, back to kitsch. I, I, will, I will then add a kind of a, perhaps an explanation to what I mean. Okay, do you want to add it now? Yes, I, I can add it now. I don't want to interrupt, I do it, but, but you I, then you Please go do. on. Go on. So, um, <laughs> I, because it was a play about you too. Yeah. And I mean, the whole media scandal in many places, and it was forbidden in, in, in like 10 countries to play, was how can you do this to children? How can you re-traumatize them, etc., etc., etc.? Why do you do it? And the strange thing is that by doing it, you are stepping out of this position that you are just a child that can't understand and so on. So that's, I just wanted to mm. add this. Yeah. The expectation of what the reenactment of, 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 of bad stuff would do to the person that reenacts it is kind of the opposite that you would expect. But can be. Yeah, can be. You course. have no control over what things... Yeah, but you can control it when you rehearse. And of course, right of course, but, but, yeah. it, but it, there are just as many outcomes as there are different people. For the public, yes, but I think for the actors, they can rehearse in a way that it is, mm -hmm. uh, it is, a, is a whatever liberating, empowering uh, effect. But go on, sorry, I was doing. I completely forgot what I was about to say. No, no, it was far away from freedom. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the drug. Uh, no, it doesn't. Matter. It's, it's a dependent. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about for you. Things. For you, is art is a dependency? You said, but on the yeah, but dependency just, always, just always has, a, has a strange, uh, strange connotation. But I actually want to say something. About what we just said. It's more interesting than what I said before. Um, I think that it's interesting how we, we live in a society that is trying more and more pro to, to protect people all the time from yes, something. True. And I already have the feeling that the only thing left is for people to die because then at least they're safe from life. Because every, I mean, it's right, you're not allowed to walk in the street because it's dangerous. You're not allowed to eat this because it's dangerous. You're not allowed to touch that because you might get sick. You're not allowed to do this because you might, this might happen to you. So all the time something is trying to protect you from something. I mean. It's a very interesting notion. I don't know where the assumption, I mean, you're, you're, you're an encyclopedia of knowledge, you might be able to help me with this, but where in history did it start that we were given the promise to live in a safe, to that life is a safe thing? Well, Nietzsche would say it's Christianity who started that promise, Ooh. but anyway, but... Um, <laughs> But, uh, no, I mean it seriously, because... It's nobody knows that. It's privilege, no? It's privilege that to think Every little injustice, every little danger, every little illness, whatever, even death, it has, uh, I has think to it be excluded. And it has to do with the demise of religion, because yes. religion, yeah, yeah, yeah. and after, you know, religion promises you in the next... But religion is gone, yeah, but let's it's see. Gone. Exactly, but it's, it's gone, yeah. so that's why... Yeah. That, that's but that's why exactly the point, that's yeah. why it's coming out, because yeah. there's less religion, that's, you're completely yeah. right, and I think it's coming, coming back to where we started. I think that you, when you said, don't do it to the audience, to the girl, because it's too much. I was thinking about I, it. I didn't want to protect the audience. I just thought, well, okay, this is that is my, my dear Rachel. Okay, I, I wasn't there, so I have nothing to say to that. But it made me think about the following, that in a way, I feel like the one thing that people are almost most terrified of these days is feelings. I mean, I've been living maybe in Germany for too long. That's also possible. But I mean, it's uh, the, the fear of, of real feeling. I mean, I, have, I sometimes see people with panic in their eyes. They go, please, please, don't force me to feel. 
And it's interesting because I've, I, maybe it's also the way I grew up, maybe it's also that I'm a, you know, a little bit uh, in my own bubble, but I think the greatest privilege to, that one can have is, is the intensity of emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's at least what, what I live for and what gives me. And in a way, that is 80% of the time pain. But pain has been the strongest and most important engine behind my work. Now, if we would protect people from everything that is painful, because that's what society is trying to do all the time, this is, as you said, injustice here, and this is there, and this is that, you try to make everything not painful, everything not, you know, now I have people that complain in a rehearsal after every, not to me, but because, you know, as music it's easier, you can say, do it louder or quieter, but as a director, you know, everything you basically say now, you cannot do anything right anymore, because you offend someone about something if you do, if you basically open your mouth. So, uh, no, I always wonder, are we really doing these people justice? Because all the pain that I've experienced has given me definitely by far more resources for my work and for my life than if I would have been protected all the time from all the things I could experience. So, um, yeah, I and I think you should, you should not, for me, you should not mix the, the ritual act of, of, of the stage and the rehearsal room. And of course, in the rehearsal room, you need safety, you need rules, you need, I mean, Everybody knows that, and I think there's a, there happened a mix mm -hmm. um, that is that is uh, that I'm just observing actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Also, as a director of a theater, that I, I know whatever happens. For example, William Tell that is playing now, it's really a play with almost no violence and almost no sex and almost no perversion and almost no whatever uh, kind of strange opinions, and even there's only one fascist on stage, so it's really soft. And, uh, and then, but I mean, in the beginning you could do a poem, uh, a monologue of trigger warnings that you have to bring in the beginning that you are safe, kind of as an institution in Zurich Schauspielhaus, that nobody would say, but I didn't know it. You know, that perhaps a fascist will say something, perhaps, somebody will do as if there is violence and, and so on. But you need to say that beforehand, otherwise... That's the, the logic of the trigger warning, no? That yeah. you say it, be, or you, do, yeah. you don't say it, but you no. have it in the program book and you have it on the door and you have it... No, I've only, I've only discovered those things recently and I'm still shocked every time I hear about it, that you get trigger warnings before you feel things. This is fantastic. I think we should have a, in real life too, we should have a little machine that every time before we fall in love or before we get scared or before we are hungry or before we have any other emotions, it'll just warn us that we are about to feel something in case we want to protect ourselves from that, we may as well go away. Yeah. Yeah. It's, compl it, it's completely absurd. Mm -hmm. It's completely absurd. If you go to the theater, also one of, one of the agreements that you have, except the fact one of them is that you know that what's happening on stage is not true, and the other one is that you will have experienced things you didn't know you're going to experience. No. Otherwise, you couldn't stay at home. Mm. No. True. Of course. If you don't like that, don't go. Now, there is a big difference, I completely agree with you, between the rehearsal setting and the, and the audience yeah. setting, mainly because, okay, you work a lot with amateurs, but I mean, with uh, professional people depend on this situation to survive. That's their job. So, of course, they should be protected to not be in a situation where they're forced to do things that are not protected or that they're in a position where they have to do it, but they have no possibility to say, I'm not comfortable with this because they have to get their salary every month. Yeah. This is a completely different situation. And as a, as a uh, you know, talking about your, your, your lovely fascist comment, as a, as a socialist, I would say I agree in protecting workers to be working in a safe space. But as an audience member, I'm sorry, going to the theater, the biggest, the biggest <coughs> privilege that can happen to you is that you get shocked. That you get, that you shock not in a sensationalist way, shocked in a way that you're moved out of your comfort zone. Otherwise, you don't need to pay money for a ticket. Go and take a bus. It also costs money, but it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> bad example. But I don't understand what this whole, uh, in, and it, it's interesting how people, you, you, we're thinking that we're protecting people from pain. But we're basically, we're depriving people of life. Because life is full of pain everywhere. Full of feeling. Full yeah. of feeling, full of yeah. everything. Feeling is a whole spectrum, you know? Now, I think that is when you talk about the situation, of course, with the girl, and also, I mean, I'm not in a professional, and so I have no opinion on what it does or doesn't do to children. I have no opinion about that. Uh, but what I'm thinking in terms of what it does to the audience, it's, you know, there is one, F, one should always separate between what is the artistic quality of something that is happening and what is the ethical side of it. And I think very often in arguments, this is getting mixed up. Because, you know, I can say that for me, from an artistic point of view, 
what you've just described, the audience asking themselves the question of, should I be listening to this? Should I be enjoying to listen to this? Should I, all of that is a very valid artistic process. Of course. Of you know, course. and so we can have a, an ethical conversation about whether it's a, it's a right or wrong thing to do or not on a, on a different page. But there is no right or wrong in art. Why, why not? No, because art, art is not, it's not, a, it's not a moralist endeavor. There is no such thing as a right or wrong art. You can ask about the, whether there's a right or wrong thing to do to a human being or to a people or to an employee and so on and so forth. But an artistic process is, first of all, not a, not a, it's not an ethical process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I can also, from an ethical point of view, because just today we were talking about, about I don't know, let's say an activist artist group mm -hmm. that are putting uh, and filming people in situations where you see that they... Uh, that they are humiliated, mm -hmm. and then this kind of, of stuff is published, and it is art. And I say, okay, this is, and that's why perhaps I use the word liberating. Mm -hmm. I think even, I mean, I'm a big fan of catharsis, for example, but I think in the end of the day, in, and that's the only meaning of the word safe space, I, I think it, it, it should have that, for example, this man who has the only time that he plays before his retirement, it is forbidden to humiliate him. It is forbidden. You know what I mean? Sure, but I think so that's, that's I the think, only that's no, no, the only but thing. I th I'm, I'm, no, let's not mix it up. I think it's absolutely important to have the conversation of whether it is ethical to do certain things or not. Mm -hmm. But I think we should separate that conversation from whether the result is a good work of art. That's yeah, all I'm saying. Of course, I yeah. think that no, but I think it's not happening. I think that what this film you're talking about and so on and so forth, there should be two different discussions. Is it okay to humiliate the people in yeah, the process or of is doing it, that? Is it or, done, it, exactly, yeah, or is it a good yeah. piece of art? And I think we should, because there are a lot of things that also happen in the past, and nowadays people come up with, oh, in 1945 or 1962 or 1913, this was done in a in a in a, in a process of creating a piece of art. Because that is not ethical, we will not consume this piece of art. That's complete. Bullshit. Yeah, that's bullshit, of course. You know, I mean, first of all, we can also say this is a great movie, this is a great play, this is a great book, and we can say that the person behind that did things that, according to our current 2022 line of ethics, is not right. But yeah, these are two different arguments. The pyramids discussion. were built with forced labor. For example, so, I mean, so don't look at the pyramids. But the thing or is, do, it's, yeah. you know, it's very easy to look at the whole of the 19th and 18th century and feel wonderfully superior to them ethically, and it's you know very comfortable for us. But you know, all our children and grandchildren in a hundred years will look at us and feel the same. Yeah, so, already, my daughters do it now. Well, there you go. I mean, so this is, a, you know, it's a very, it's a very boring yeah. experiment. But, but if you look at it from right and wrong, because you said we should also have this conversation on good and bad. You know, is it ethically or morally? Yes, but yeah? separate mm -hmm. it. It's separate, but. But what I thought was so interesting about your five easy pieces, uh, which I watched several times, because there are many of those questions where you have to ask yourself whether you are still uh, in, are still okay with yourself, which I think is a wonderful theater performance where you're forced to at least you are led to a point it's where you exactly eh? a performance where about you, what you describe. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly and, and a performance that's, that's that goes why I, in, I think it's, a, it's an amazing piece, uh, <laughs> five easy pieces actually. But um, mm -hmm. And, but on the other hand... But that's an artistic question you're asking us. Mm -hmm. But it makes you... Um, you could say, for instance, uh, it reminded me of The Hunger Games. The, Hunger, of what, of? the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games, okay. Where the, you uh, look at a, a huge uh, uh, Hollywood uh, cinema where actually what you're w watching is children killing each other. Yeah, teenagers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah young, I mean, under 18. Yeah. And they kill each other. And you... Love it. You enjoy it. You're watching it. You're buying it. You're, uh, and but what you're doing is watching it. People, uh, I mean, underage people killing each other. And then they, the director says, well, it's you know, it's about a fascist society, which I want to show how bad a fascist society. Is. But what you're really doing is enjoying, you know, a, a, a movie about children killing each other. So aren't you, maybe? becoming a bit fascist yeah. yourself. Yeah. But are you supposed to then not yes. describe anything in reality that is unethical in your art? Yeah, I mean, Hunger Games, I, I watched it uh, many times mm -hmm. with my daughters, by the way. Yeah. So I, I Probably know, almost I know the theories yeah. quite yeah. well. <laughs> and um, why would they, uh, with Katniss, why would they identify yeah. with her? Um, because there is more than what you describe, but this is a part Much of more. it. Yeah. And that's perhaps, uh, I was reflecting while you were uh, discussing, it becomes interesting when it's mixed, when beauty is mixed with this kind of, of questioning what is the act of 
watching this beauty, how is this beauty produced, what is... If yeah. all this comes together in an art piece, of course it's a valuable art piece. But still in the very end, and this is really the difference, of course we all insist that the actress who is playing this killed child uh, is not really killed and is not humiliated. You know what no. I mean? Yeah, but, and but that she understands, uh, perhaps even it's absolutely. something different that, that, that she with, understands that's what That's with the Hunger Games, it's fantasy. But yeah. here you're playing another trick on top of that because I cannot tell myself as an audience, that this did not happen. Because yeah, that's is, the interesting thing. Because we've it did with happen. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is of real. Course. I mean, it's, well, it's, you mean that's the, interesting. The, I'm saying it's real because it's probably not. <laughs> but the text and the situation has been real. And it makes yeah. it more difficult for me to watch. Does it? Ethically, it, may, it, it adds another yeah, layer of... of, real, of yeah. Well, that's, that's, of, no, I mean, that's an interesting question. Why? Because, you know, the only thing that changes between this girl telling a true story mm -hmm. and this girl not telling a true story mm -hmm. is you knowing that fact. Uh, yeah, but I do know. Right. But no, <laughs> let's not change the yeah. fact that what is happening on stage could be identical. And, and if I can sure. add, sure. if I can just add one more information mm -hmm. to this situation is that for you it's real, for the children not. For you it's a real, it, that was the interesting thing I found out when I was working with them. Mm -hmm. For them it was like playing Richard III. For them, it was an old story that they heard about yeah. while I was, when it was happening, a teenager. So I was kind of traumatized. And it was interesting to see these children playing Richard III to a people that knew Richard III. Mm -hmm. So you had a kind of a traumatized crowd, and they were kind of the analysts who were trying to bring them through the trauma again, yeah. to perhaps liberate them, if you agree, <laughs> uh, from the trauma. <laughs> Feeling a little triggered now. <laughs> so it goes too far. Yeah, but... Um, okay, okay. But most of the most of the audience uh, would know that this is this horrible horror story, which is actually had been played out in the real in real life. Yeah. yeah. So you're playing with an extra layer of uh, making your audience uh, morally uncomfortable. Yeah, and why? but, but, but they why? don't I'm know. Really, yeah. I really want to understand yeah. why is that a difference? I think it's a it's a. I mean it's. Not a difference, but to go to the trauma, it helps that what happened is, was real. Or to say differently that it is a real social trauma. Because I think that's a difference if you just know the information is true, but it's about the bus stops uh, twice when you go to the airport. So this is an information, it's true, but I think it would not add to a play when you use this information. But when you use something that is really traumatic and deeply implanted in society as something that is an information you can't process over a generation, then you have found a topic that has this effect, a additional effect. But if you, because these are topics that we anyway cannot grasp because it's a level of cr cruelty that is for a person who is not mentally disturbed, in, in ungraspable. So, and there are these th things that happen on different levels of society in different situations. And the thing is, if you, let's say, make a play, whether it's a pedophile or a murderer or a rapist, all of those crimes we cannot grasp. If you make it about something that has never happened, still there are so many similar stories that are happening all the time. Does it, is it not the same that it's in a way a, let's say, a, a symbol for all of those? Does it matter? Because the thing is, I, I find that interesting. I don't have an answer. I just find it interesting that the only difference between the, us experiencing it differently is that we know that this is a true story. But if, so if it's like when you walk in, in the film and you said this is based on a true story, or it doesn't. But the, what is about to happen artistically is exactly identical. So the only thing we're changing is our own state of mind. Yeah, and I, I really think the social situation, but when we are talking about a real trauma, yeah. then the social situation but let's say you take this, is a different one. I mean, of course, this is in this area, of course, but if yeah. you take it and play it in Argentina, where maybe people... Strangely, the same happened. Then, and, and, and yeah, now I have to, I'm sorry, I have to agree a bit more with you, because reflecting about this, I see that... And, and the same, we had another play about the genocide in Rwanda, and then we went to Japan, and everybody would connect it to the Dutru or the genocide they had themselves. Exactly. So, and for them, it becomes a story that is symbolically, metaphorically... Yeah, but even if you, would, therefore, if you play the exact same piece, and you would say... And they wouldn't know that it's a real story. It's a horrific thing. Yeah. So they would feel yeah. horrific feelings. True. I mean, so I'm just curious, what does it add or what does it change? Or why psychologically does it change that we know it happened? I th maybe it's also part of this weird voyeurism that you were talking about, that we feel we are now exposed to something that is actually 
because you know it's always the the idea that the, the mass murderer is actually looks like you or me and we don't know that they are a mass murderer you know maybe it's that element too that people are terrified to realize that it could be them because it is something that happened among them i don't know i'm just asking i'm wondering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it a bit more, more um, difficult again. Voila, um, let's, um, let's do it. And see whether we can add another layer of um, interpretation or confusion to our conversation. Um, we have a, a, a piece from uh, uh, Grief and Beauty. Okay. And um, uh, uh, a piece about death and grief. And we see the euthanasia of a woman called uh, Johanna. Okay. And let's have a look at that one. Who made this uh, uh, perverse choice, by the way? I did. <laughs> Johanna loved classical music. All of her life, she sang in a choir. She even performed on this stage once. We met her this summer, a month before her euthanasia. She seemed so alive and radiant. You don't see me suffering, she said, but I do suffer. And I don't want to spend the last days of my life in pain. The 27th of August was Johanna's 85th birthday. One day later, she died. Together with her, we decided to film it. Her wish was to speak openly about death to show it, because it's the loneliest work, she said. I, I, I thought you would show the euthanasia of uh, Johanna. We are, but I'm, I'm, we are going to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it is just the introduction. Because I'm not sure if out of the context this, but you do what you want. Huh? Well, um, um, I, I, I made the selections also because, um, uh, because you write, because it, uh, how, could, how could that be forgotten? It's our real place. And I think your interest in reality, and I'm just trying to get us to think about what is real and what is not. And you have so good examples of that. That's yeah. why I huh, took I, several of them to see whether we, whether we can get around or inside what is performing and what is real and what is not. Yeah. For me, what makes the difference between uh, movie, for example, and, and, and the stage is that mm -hmm. um, when you make a movie, it's you always end at, at realism. And when I'm talking, perhaps it's also a misunderstanding because when I'm talking about realism on stage, it's always this kind of dialectics that you are yourself, you are a public figure, you are an actor and the role, and you are yourself. You are on stage, but you are really there. You're talking about something that is absent, but you are now here. You are alone, but there is the public. You are kind of doing as if you do it the first time, but you do it 500 times and there's the script, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is the stage, and uh, that's, that's this tension that I, 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 I really like, and I don't like if, if, and that's why I don't, for example, like incorporating psychological play, all these kind of things. You can use it, but I don't like if you take it really. I, I make a, a masterclass in, in Venice Biennale next week, uh, about Greek tragedy, and there was uh, there was a casting call to people uh, make one monologue of a Greek tragedy and send it that you can see who you are. And from 400 people, 400 people tried to be this Medea, this Phaedra, and to make mm -hmm. me believe that they are Medea and Phaedra, and I didn't learn anything about them. I had the impression, perhaps I was not watching good enough. But anyway, they cannot be Medea. They are always they themselves. Can't, they can't be. No, nobody and can be anyone. No, I know what you mean. So you always try to. I, you are absolutely right, but you can play in between, for example, as an yeah. actor. You can, I mean, in Flanders you can. I don't know if you're also in Holland. But I like, it's an acting style, perhaps, too. Eh? No, no, but I'm not but talking about... I, but what I mean is yeah. that, just to, to perhaps... Yeah, yeah, I, I feel that you didn't get it 100%, what I want to say. So it's a... Uh, there is that you would be the character, but at the same time, when you play the character, it's a bit Brechtian, too. You watch yourself playing. You are... You are kind of uh, being together with the third one who watches you doing it. And at the same time, you are really in it. And, 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 and you are kind of in between. You are in this field. You are in this situation of doing it. And which part of that process are you trying to remove? No, that's how, how I want. I, I don't want to remove anything. That's, mm -hmm. that's the, the presence of all this at the same time that mm -hmm. I think is, is being on stage 
for somebody. Because uh, again, to answer the question, would it make sense to have a kind of a dark room somewhere in the, inside a mountain where you are alone and you are acting? It, it's nonsense, you know? Mm. It would make, perhaps for the person acting. That's interesting, and then I'm th comparing it to music and thinking a, a pianist sitting alone in his room can experience something absolutely extraordinary just between him and the piano. Yeah, true. It's different. Yeah, yeah perhaps it's a difference. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, why is it? It is, obviously, yeah. but why is it? I, I think music is, I mean, perhaps it's a cliche and it's not right, but I think music is more direct than, 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 than acting in the end of the day. But you can also experience indirect things still by yourself. Yeah, of course. But no, of course. no actor would sit at home and recite in a monologue unless they have to learn it um, and have uh, you know, a cathartic experience, or maybe very few. Yeah, and now when I'm thinking about these people sitting in front of the camera acting media, that later somebody would watch it, of course the situation itself is wrong, so they, yeah. they have no yeah. chance yeah. to do it yeah. right. Um, would you agree with Joel that music can be as political as your trade? Um, I mean, now as a um, as a historian or sociologist, of course, you have a lot of. I mean, now just like I bring it a bit back to the concrete, if you agree, mm, please. You have <laughs> many moments when <laughs> songs play the huge political role in movements, and I think for. I mean, I see it when I when I did. I mean, as I say, sometimes I'm I'm really dogmatic, and I want to push a message in the head of of people by also emotion. You're saying you're them. really dogmatic. Sometimes, so, sometimes I, I think it's necessary to... Huh. I, I don't get that impression if I look at your work, but you know... Yeah, but like, lately, for example, <laughs> I mean, when we did the, 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 the New Gospel, for example, there are mm -hmm. moments where we use exactly classical music to have this kind of, yeah. of strength that Sounds this music, music has. Yeah. Or lately I made a... Uh, in a church I made a, uh, uh, an event for regularization of refugees in, in, uh, in, in Belgium. And... We sang Bella Ciao all together, and it was super, super strong. Wonderful partisan song in Italian. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, yeah, very melancholic, actually, yeah. but when yeah. you sing it a bit faster, then it's a strong song. Yeah. And, um, and this, is, this is the power of music, and I can explain my, my kind of declarations on and on, and, and, and then comes Bella Ciao, and things are clear, you know? Yeah. So that's that's it. That's then how you, music. Then you read I mean, sort of... I, if you talk about it, the political strengths of... I think what music also can do that you feel really the strengths of togetherness sometimes. Yeah. For example, in a choir, or I mean, everybody of us knows how it is to sing in a choir, for example. Mm -hmm. Or I, I never played in an orchestra, but I can imagine that it is the same, that this kind of feeling to be to be together in this one thing that you do, this is incredible. And uh, you know, It's interesting that you say that. It, it makes me think of something, actually, because... Um, not so long ago, in my theatre that you know, um, we, did a, we did a fundraising concert for Ukraine after the beginning of the war, which was, a, let's say, an endeavour that I had mixed feelings about, as I do about the general way the sort of German cultural scene reacted to the war. And so I found I had to look for my own way to deal with that, that I can still stand behind what I did. So I, I gave a relatively long speech on that. And then after that speech, we played Egmont. Rede im Rahmen des Benefizkonzertes Give Peace a Chance. Correct. Yeah, das yes. habe ich hier. Yeah. Great homework. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I, so I talked for 20 minutes. I think it was not such a bad text. And then I played Egmont and I felt like such an idiot. Because, of like, because everything I said was said 30 times better by these eight pieces, eight minutes of music that I thought I could have actually skipped the whole speech mm -hmm. and just played Egmont. It was not a bad speech. I, I appreciate that, uh, uh, but but I thought everything I wanted to say was a very about, political speech. But <laughs> yes, but I think that in a way Beethoven was a lot more political than me, and really? a lot more and very clear, and much more effective. Egmont is Beethoven. Yes, Egmont yeah. by Beethoven. Yeah. Yes, and I thought about it afterwards. Like yes, of course, it's not as concrete. It didn't make the because I wanted to make a, a few very important points for me personally that are yeah. important. For me. I wanted to bring them across, but I thought at the end of that, nothing I could have said. Or actually, and even people way more articulate or a lot cleverer than me could say, could come close to what this man wrote in eight minutes of music where there's not a single word. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps it yeah, made stronger what you said. Huh? It's, funny that you, it's funny that you come to this piece because I was drawing, trying to draw this conversation to a close. <laughs> and, um, 
It's in German. Well, you both understand German uh, quite well. Um, um, I don't know whether you all understand German that well, but let's see. Um, because you said, well, my music has nothing to do really with freedom. You said earlier on in our conversation, uh, because it's I did. Yeah, because it's it's my um, it's I'm I'm. Uh, I'm um, uh, hooked on it, you know, so I'm not really free. Oh, no, 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 I just said it's like a drug that you're addicted to. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so um, and here you said some wonderful things about, you know, um, yes... Ooh, Lenin? Uh, oh, who? Hmm? Lenin? No, no, here, uh, Joel said some uh, uh, wonderful things here. That, um, on, Lenin? On, on, on not, on not, Lenin said, and he would now quote Lenin. I was on not, no, no, on not boycotting, on not boycotting uh, Russian culture, and, and although what Putin does is very, very bad, but not excluding that. And, and, and then you end it with, Lass uns die wahre Freiheit in unseren Denken beginnen, dann wird die Freiheit in der Realität, in der Realität folgen. Let's be free in the mind, because in, uh, in that, uh, and because uh, in that, manner, uh, uh, we will be free in reality. Hmm? Well, that's a, uh, just an a, a indirect paraphrase of Lenin. Not Lenin, but Lenin. Yeah. <laughs> who said, if you imagine it, it can be real. Yeah. But it's also, you know, to be honest, it's, this, is, you know, this is also one part of the problem I had with that whole occasion. Saying that is a privilege you have when you stand in Bremen, having just conducted a classical symphony orchestra, and you can say, if you think it will be real. Um, which is why I find all those events very problematic. Because when you're sitting in, a, in an Ukrainian city where people are bombing you, you're not thinking or imagining anything. You're trying to think, how on earth will I find safety and food? So there is, and that's also, and the main point of that speech was that I was asking ourselves, why are we doing all of these things? Because to me, there is so much more of we're doing it to feel that we are on the right side and to tap ourselves on the shoulder than to actually help anyone. Yeah, so you're doing it uh, for yourself. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. we're all guilty of that same crime in a way, mm -hmm. you know? And so, that's, so in a way, that sentence is absolutely right and absolutely flawed at the same time. And that's the nice thing about music, that it's not flawed in the same time. Oh, of course it is. The flaw is the most beautiful thing about art. Of course it is. But that's, that, for that, we're going to need another two hours. Um, I'm going to um, thank you both very much. Um, I'm sure we've confused um, at least me for, um, uh, I hope, on a higher level. But um, we made sure that we talked about what it is to perform on stage and what it is to do with your audience. Um, the selection of your work was entirely mine. Um, uh, there's much more of your work to do, but it really intrigued me on how you go about, you know, um, uh, getting me to points, me as an audience, to points in my mind where um, I want to be, but I'm a little bit afraid to be sometimes, or I need to question myself morally what I'm doing and seeing. And the way you handle that on stage is just, I think, there's no other example on the continent on stage who's doing that so well as you are doing. So um, you. That's why I choose the subjects we choose and we talked about it. And um, thank you very much for uh, conducting this difficult conversation on what it is to be on stage and what we're trying to do with being live on stage. I think it's the most important discussion we as performers can have at the moment because the world is retreating behind glass, um, uh, behind uh, computer screens and what is it to be in each other's presence and what are we doing in each other's presence on stage. I want to thank you both again very, thank very you, much um, for trying to uh, have a live and real conversation about things. You, I didn't, you know, tell you what fragments I was uh, having. I, so I appreciate it very, very, very much that you just openly, you know, uh, uh, engage in a conversation about what it is, why theater, what it is to perform and why do we do it. Um, this was the second in our three pieces of conversation. It's not five easy pieces, it's three easy pieces. The beginning of November, we will have another conversation on stage performing with Marina Abramovic. Beginning of November, um, hope to see you back then, um, maybe earlier in the Bali. Uh, thank you very, very much for um, indulging with my, um, with my questions and uh, the time here. Thank you very much for coming. Hope to see you again, or hope to drink a beer with you. Thank you. <laughs>